When you hear the word princess, most people immediately go to Disney and their plethora of princesses. However, princesses are just as much a staple in video games as they are in animation. And Nintendo's lineup of princesses is still popular enough to give Disney's a run for their money. From classics such as Peach and Zelda to more niche characters such as Shida and Melia, Nintendo has no shortage of princesses at their disposal. Which begs the question, how do all these regal ladies stack up in terms of morality? It's time to rank these women of Nintendo royalty to see who is the most noble and who is the most wicked. I'm Kifunosi with 1UP Binge, and this is Nintendo Princesses Good to Evil. We have to go over the rules. First, they have to be actual princesses, or the equivalent of such in some capacity or another. Sorry, Agatha fans, but proclaiming yourself as a princess of insects just doesn't cut it here. That said, if a particular series is lacking in any significant princesses, we will be a bit more lenient in defining what does count as a princess. On the flip side, regarding Legend of Zelda and Fire Emblem specifically, we'll only be looking at the most prominent characters from these series, because otherwise these two would take up over 85% of our list, and even still they collectively make up more than half of it. Lastly, we'll be looking at only one entry per game unless the character in question makes multiple consistent appearances across several games. Again, this is only relevant to the Fire Emblem series, but it is a significant distinction, as we will explain later. With that being said, let's get into our ranking. As usual, we'll be starting with our most noble princesses and working our way down. These characters are the good. Our gold medal of good goes to the late Zora princess Mipha. We don't get to see much of Mipha in Breath of the Wild since she, like the other champions, is already dead by the time the game starts. However, through flashbacks and the way that Zora elders talk about her, we get a clear grasp of what kind of a person she was. A childhood friend of Link, Mipha would often use her healing powers on him anytime he got hurt, which was, well, it happened a lot, apparently. What's more, it's made very clear that Mipha had a crush on Link, even going as far as to craft the Zora armor for him, which does function similarly to an engagement ring in Zora society. However, as Link starts getting closer to Zelda, Mipha shows no sign of jealousy whatsoever, and still treats Zelda with the same amount of kindness as she does anyone else. Of course, to address the divine beast Varuta in the room, we all know the real reason why Mipha makes it to the top of our list. As a champion, she fought alongside the others in order to try to prevent the revival of Calamity Ganon, using her spear and the Varuta in order to stand against him. Unfortunately, Ganon was able to predict this and was able to overpower the champions themselves, and Mipha ended up losing her life to the Water Blight Ganon. There are plenty of princesses who are willing to fight for justice, but not many who would be willing to lay down their life for the cause, and even fewer who actually do. For that level of dedication on top of her overall kindness, we can't think of any other princess who deserves the gold medal more than Mipha. Not too far behind with the silver medal of good, we have the princess from the future, Lucina. Having grown up in a post-apocalyptic hellscape, Lucina made it her mission to stop the events which led to her future's demise. She, along with her friends, attempted the risky and incomplete awakening ritual in order to travel back in time to prevent the events which led to the revival of the fell dragon Grima, which brought about her timeline's fate. Because of this, as well as his death in her timeline, Lucina is particularly protective of her father, Krom, as she believes his safety to be paramount to protecting her future. This is a bit of a double-edged sword for her ranking, however, as while this does make her genuinely heroic, it does cause her to make some rash decisions, namely when she attempted to kill Robin when she deemed them a threat to Krom's safety. Still, she's quick to own up to her mistakes, and outside of that one example, we don't have anything to dock her for, so we can easily give Lucina a spot this high up. The bronze medal goes to the Princess of Destiny herself, Zelda. Ranking Zelda on a list like this is never easy, since there's no one Zelda. Each incarnation of the titular princess is their own separate character with their own thoughts, motives, and morals, so we can't really point to the actions of an individual as a means of judging the collective. As a result, we can only look at the personality and character traits consistent across most, if not all, incarnations of Zelda in order to rank them as a whole. 
unfortunately, all the Zeldas have been consistently good characters, with them all being kind, selfless individuals with the good of the people in their hearts. They generally have a good relationship with their respective links, and while they are damsels in distress in some capacity, they usually are capable of lending a hand to their links in defeating whatever final boss they deal with, either directly or indirectly. We don't have much in common to go on, however, so we can't place her any higher than this, but without anything to dock her for either, we can give Zelda a spot that's high up on our list. Our next spot goes to our first of many one-off characters, Melia Antiqua. For being the only representative from the Xeno universe, it's at least comforting that Melia earns a high spot on this list. This is especially poetic as she is also easily the most tragic figure on this list. Which is really saying a lot considering our top two, just to name a couple. As a high Entia half-blood, Melia has the worst of both worlds, being discriminated against by her pure blood supremacist high Entia society, while also unable to embrace her home's heritage due to outliving them several times over. She grows up in a hostile environment where her very existence is a scandal threatening the entire monarchy, and she has to deal with several assassination attempts throughout her life. So, when Melia is named the successor to the throne over her pure-blooded older half-brother, well, we're sure we don't need to explain how not well that goes over. As if that wasn't enough, Melia has to watch countless members of her family and close friends die before her. She watches her mother die of old age while she's still a child, and has to deal with having her entourage getting killed on a regular basis by the Telethia constantly attacking them. And let's not forget the climax of the game, where upon the reawakening of Zanza, the High Entia are blasted with a high concentration of ether, which transforms them into the monstrous Telethia, effectively wiping out all of Melia's society in one fell swoop. As the cherry atop the misery Sunday, Melia also has to deal with her growing feelings towards Shulk, something she has never experienced before due to, understandably, being very closed off to others by nature. However, she is fully aware that it could never be, as Shulk clearly still has feelings for Fiora, a sentiment which only becomes more apparent when Fiora is revealed to be alive after all this time. Despite all this, and despite all logical reasoning, Melia never once complains nor breaks down in the face of her situation. She keeps her suffering to herself and greets each day with a smile so as not to make her friends worry about her. She always keeps her people's needs in mind and doesn't hold their discrimination of her against them. And when Fiora is reunited with the group, Melia welcomes her with open arms and has no hesitation with treating her as just as much of a friend as the others, contenting herself with the thought that it would be better for Shulk to be happy rather than herself. Overall, Melia is an absolute saint, and the fact that she's not in the top three is really indicative of just how good the previous entries really are. Moving on to a much simpler entry, next up we have Seida. Seida is the childhood friend, fiance, and later wife of the legendary hero king, Marth. And that should tell you everything you need to know about her morality. Kind and caring, almost to a fault, she cares deeply for her friends and will do whatever it takes to keep them safe. She's also a benevolent ruler, both as the princess of Talos and the queen of Altea, and as a result, is beloved by all who know her. Additionally, while she dislikes fighting, she doesn't hesitate to throw herself into battle to protect her friends, proving herself to be one of Marth's bravest allies. She does have a slight manipulative streak as she typically has a way of getting what she wants. However, this is mainly a byproduct of her natural kindness, and she only uses this power for good so we can't really knock her for that. With all this, Sita easily earns herself a high spot on this list, though with her being the wife of one of the most morally perfect characters in Nintendo's history, what else did you expect? Our next spot goes to a character most of you wouldn't think of as a princess, Kumatora from Mother 3. While she may only be a princess in the fictional retelling of reality that people of Tazmili Village created for themselves, no other major character in the Earthbound universe comes close to being called a princess, so we decided that she counts. That being said, we have to acknowledge that Kumatora doesn't exactly embody the image of a princess, being fairly crash, tomboyish, and impulsive to start with. However, despite her rough exterior, she is quite clearly a kind and heroic character, accompanying Lucas on his journey across the Nowhere Islands to help as many people as possible. She's even willing to make sacrifices herself in order to protect others, such as when she triggered a trap in order to protect the hummingbird egg, or when she spent three years working as a waitress while looking for Duster, despite how she hated having to act more feminine. 
She may not be a real princess, but Kumatora proves herself to be a kind and courageous companion more than worthy of the title, as well as a spot this high up. Getting back to our actual princesses, next we have a two-way tie with both Celica and Elincia. We're ranking these two together since they're basically in the same exact situation. As the last surviving members of their respective royal families, they were brought up in secret, and thus never grew up as princesses. Celica in particular is especially kind and thoughtful, having grown up inside a priory, and generally dislikes being treated as a princess, as she doesn't feel like she deserves the title. She also hates violence, but that doesn't stop her from taking up arms in order to protect those she holds dear. Alincia is also very kind, being among the few Bjork who do not discriminate against Logoods, working to free them from slavery and treating them as true members of society. We also see her as a strong leader, due to Radiant Dawn taking place after her coronation, and as queen, she's able to usher in a new golden age as one of the most beloved monarchs in Crimean history. There's not a whole lot that separates these two, other than that one stint in Shadows of Valentia where Selica becomes possessed by Duma, though the key word here being possessed means we can't knock her for it. With that in mind, both she and Elincia easily earned themselves a spot in the good category. Next up we have the most popular princess on this list, Peach. If we just ignore the countless fan theories speculating how Toadstool is the true villain of the Mario universe and just look at her canonical appearances, it becomes abundantly clear that Peach doesn't have a malicious bone in her body. She's especially kind and patient, treating everyone in the Mushroom Kingdom with the same level of compassion that they have for her. She cares deeply for her friends and is willing to try to find any way she can to help them whenever they're in danger. Additionally, she isn't one to hold grudges either, as even after all that Bowser has done, Peach doesn't resent him for it, and is even willing to show him genuine gratitude when he does end up helping her. However, this does highlight the biggest flaw with Peach in that she's unwilling to take preventative action, or even really any action at all in some cases, when Bowser acts up. As the meme goes, she constantly gets herself kidnapped, to the point where even the residents of the Mushroom Kingdom have become somewhat jaded to that fact. If this were a question of capability, this wouldn't be an issue. However, Peach has proven herself to be fully capable on her own, like when she teams up with Mario in Super Mario Bros. 2 and Super Paper Mario, or when the roles are completely reversed in Super Princess Peach. Sadly, these examples prove themselves to be the exceptions to the rule, as the times where she serves as the passive damsel in distress easily fall into the majority. So we have to drop her a few spots for that. Still, we have to admit that Peach is still good, and more than deserves a spot in this section of the list. Rounding out the good characters, our next spot goes to Erika. Like the last few entrants, Erika is especially kind and considerate, doing everything she can to protect those close to her. She is especially fond of her twin brother Ephraim, actually a bit too fond at times, considering they are the first pair of siblings capable of getting married, which is... Uh, yeah. Anyway, she's also very forgiving, as she's able to trust Leon even after he turns evil. Though this proves to be a double-edged sword, as the latter is able to take advantage of her because of this. Additionally, it should be noted that Adika dislikes fighting, yet she doesn't hesitate to dive into battle, since she understands that their situation forces her to take up arms. Yes, this is the third time this list where this has come up, but it's still worth noting. Nevertheless, Erika proves herself just as heroic as any other Fire Emblem princess, so she easily earns a spot in the good category. And that does it for the good characters, so now it's time to descend into neutral territory. We've officially reached the gray area. Starting off this section, we have the princess of Sarasaland, Daisy. Like Peach, Daisy is incredibly kind and friendly, being very close friends with Mario and the others. She's a bit of a tomboy, but that doesn't stop her from showing her more caring side when the situation situation calls for it. The reason we're placing her here in the gray area is because she doesn't really do anything. Her only main series appearance thus far is Super Mario Land, where she serves as the damsel in distress of the game and not much else. Every other appearance Daisy's had since then has been exclusively side series games where the line between good and evil is blurry at best and non-existent at worst. Because of this, we can't exactly justify placing her in the good category alongside the more heroic characters that make up the bulk of that section. However, she's still a kind character, so we can at least give Daisy the top spot of this section. We're about halfway through the list and we've already reached our penultimate Fire Emblem character, Corrin. 
While technically Corrin may only be a princess half of the time due to being an avatar with a variable gender, both variants are effectively the same character. So we're going to do what the majority of the fanbase already does and pretend that male Corrin doesn't exist. Anyway, while Corrin may be the protagonist of the story, a title which is surprisingly rare for Fire Emblem avatars, there are a few factors which keep her from placing in the good category. Like we've already mentioned multiple times, Corrin is an avatar character, meaning that a lot of her actions and decisions are determined by the player, meaning that much of her morality is similarly up to the player's discretion. Additionally, even in areas where the player has no control over her, she's overall a bit too naive and childish for her situation, and that leads to some consequences early in the game, where she becomes partially responsible for the war between Hoshido and Nor. Speaking of which, this also highlights the biggest question mark on Corrin's record, which is the fact that the war between Hoshido and Nor itself is one giant grey area, fittingly enough. Neither side is inherently wrong, with them being merely set against each other due to the mechanizations of an evil god. And Corrin has legitimate ties to both sides, being torn between her real family and her adoptive family. As a result, both the birthright and conquest roots of the story end up being a Pyrrhic victory at best which hurts her ranking quite considerably. The Revelation campaign does circumvent this, preventing her from dropping any lower. And at the end of the day, she's still a hero who cares about those around her, so we can cut Corn some slack and give her a spot in upper neutral territory. Plus, while we're here, we also want to give a quick honorable mention to Korn's sisters, Sakura, Hinoka, Elise, Camilla, and Azura. All five of these are significant figures in the Fire Emblem universe who are more than deserving of a spot on this list. However, as per our third rule for the list, we ultimately decided to leave them off of it in favor of focusing on the main character of the game. If you're curious about where each of them would have ranked, we can at least say that all five of them, with the possible exception of Camilla, would have earned a spot in the good tier. Azura in particular would have earned a spot near the top of the list, though the top five would have probably remained the same regardless. Our next entry takes us to the stars with the queen of the cosmos, Rosalina. Rather than being a typical damsel in distress, Rosalina serves as Mario's guide for the first Mario Galaxy game, and that's pretty much the beginning and end of her involvement in the Mario universe. True, she does make a few more appearances after this, but only in background details and in spin-off titles, which does not give her a lot to work with. She does have one playable appearance in Super Mario 3D World, exclusively as a post-game unlockable character well after the story is completed. The difference here is that while Daisy hasn't been able to do anything, Rosalina has far less of an excuse for sitting on the sidelines. Not only has she not been held captive, but she also has demonstrated herself to be one of the most powerful figures in the Mario universe. This makes her inaction during these games, even when she is personally affected by the events of the story, reflect a lot worse on her than it does anyone else on this list. Still, she's a very kind person in general, being a mother figure to Loomis, so we can at least cut Rosalina a little slack and give her a spot this high up. We're heading back to Zora's domain with our next entry, Ruto. As the Sage of Water, Ruto takes on a much more proactive role than most side characters in her game. As a child, she gives Link the spiritual stone of water. Then as an adult, she helps him seal away the evil power in the Water Temple to restore Lake Hylia. That being said, we did have to dock her a few points for, to put it bluntly, being a spoiled brat. When Link first meets her, Ruto's stubbornness gets her into trouble constantly, resulting in her getting swallowed by Lord Jabu Jabu and angering the big Octo inside. Then after they get out, she lets her crush on the Hero of Time be known so as to make him uncomfortable, even seven years later when she guides him through the Water Temple. Fortunately, these are mainly surface level faults, and they don't negatively impact the story in any major way, so we can at least spare Ruto from falling any lower than this. For our true neutral spot, we have probably the most forgotten princess on this list, Shokura from Wario Land 4. If you don't remember who Shokura is, we forgive you. She only appears at the very end of the game. That's not to say she isn't present throughout though, as she's also both the black cat and the shop owner who assists Wario inside the Golden Pyramid. It's also tough to say exactly what she looks like, as her appearance is dependent on how much of her treasure is recovered from the pyramid by the end of the game. 
Even official depictions vary, with her official artwork showing her young princess form and her appearance in Super Mario Kun using her Wario-like appearance. Regardless, we have to place her here because we don't really know anything about her other than that she was cursed by the Golden Diva. She is helpful towards Wario as the Black Cat, though this could just be so she can regain her true form whichever form that is. However, since Shokura hasn't been seen nor heard from since, we have to place her near the middle of our list due to a sheer lack of information. This next one might be a bit of a stretch, but we're placing Anthea and Concordia next. As the adoptive sisters to N, Anthea and Concordia would technically be considered princesses due to N's title as the king of Team Plasma, even though their official titles are goddesses and Team Plasma is hardly a monarchy, but whatever. Anyway, while you would think that their affiliation with an evil organization would be grounds for placing these two in the bad category, they actually do a good job of avoiding the accountability. Their only role in Team Plasma is to take care of N, distancing themselves from the crimes the rest of the team is involved with. They even take the opportunity to heal the player's Pokemon and ask them to defeat N so that he can be healed from the pain in his heart. Additionally, when Team Plasma split in two during the sequels, Anthea and Concordia both stuck to the good side working with the old Team Plasma to nurture orphaned Pokemon and reunite lost ones with their trainers. That being said, at the end of the day, these two are incredibly minor characters with little to no involvement in either story, which granted does save them from being in the bad category due to their affiliation with Team Plasma, but it also prevents them from placing any higher than lower neutral territory. Still, for being minor characters, Anthea and Concordia do a great job separating themselves from their more villainous relations. Our next entry goes to the Twilight Princess herself, Midna. This might seem a bit harsh to anyone who's actually played the games, but the competition for this list has just been incredibly tough this time around. As a result, a lot of Midna's sins in the early part of the story really come back to bite her in comparison. She starts off as callous and uncaring, concerned only with saving her own world from Zant while not caring what happens to the world of light. She coerces Link into helping her without offering much of anything in return, forcing the hero into dangerous situations while she remains hidden in the shadows. Additionally, there's the matter of the origin of the Twily, though that becomes more of a sins of the father situation, so that's a bit more suspect. Ultimately, however, Midna is able to make up for her mistakes, with her coming around to being a genuinely kind and caring companion for Link. She's also able to step up and fight for the safety of both worlds, and is even willing to sacrifice herself in order to get Link and Zelda to safety. In any other list, Midna would have been a shoo-in for the good category, but compared to the rest of this list, she unfortunately lands here instead. For our final entry in the neutral tier, we have another Zelda princess, Styla. While she is technically in the same category as the others, Styla marks the precipitous drop in morality on this list. Every other entry in this category has been pushing the good tier, but Styla is the only one that just narrowly escaped falling into the bad category. As a stand-in for Zelda, Styla is a beloved figure in the Kingdom of Hytopia until she gets cursed by Lady Maud. The thing is, with the fashion-centric theme of Triforce heroes, this actually reflects worse on Styla, with the driving force of the entire story boiling down to her own vanity. The so-called curse, which sparks the story, is her being forced to wear an irremovable jumpsuit and becoming too humiliated to appear in public again. Even then, when Link finally removes the curse, Styla doesn't even seem all that grateful, with her giving Link the very same curse tights as his only reward for the quest. The only thing we can say to her credit is that she at least isn't malicious, and that she does care about those around her to some degree. That and the fact that most of the superficial traits she has are mainly a byproduct of the world around her, so we can't be too judgmental of her. Because of this, we can't exactly say Styla is a bad character, though she just barely makes it into the neutral tier regardless. Finally, we've reached the bad to evil category. Surprisingly, despite it being a trope they've helped to popularize, there aren't that many evil Nintendo princesses, meaning this section is only comprised of our bottom three. In third place, with the Bronze Medal of Evil, we have our third consecutive Zelda princess, Hilda. When Link first arrives in Low Rule, Hilda appears to be on his side, asking him to rescue the Seven Sages and reclaim the Triforce of Courage while she holds Yuga back. 
However, this was all a ruse, as she was actually working with Yuga in order to steal the Hyrulean Triforce in order to replace the Triforce they had lost. She does this knowing full well that she is dooming countless Hylians to suffer, yet she does it anyway, attempting to kill Link once he retrieves the Triforce of Courage. What keeps her from dropping any lower is the fact that she's able to somewhat redeem herself. After Yuga is defeated, Ravio appeals to her conscience and convinces her to let Link and Zelda return home with their Triforce. Additionally, we have to recognize that, well, Hilda didn't really have much choice. By the time she learns of Hyrule, Low Rule has already been all but completely destroyed, and she was desperate to save what was left of her kingdom. We can give her a little sympathy, but overall, Hilda has a lot more bad than good, and she's a good start to this oddly short section. The Silver Medal of Evil goes to our final Fire Emblem character, Edelgard. Three Houses is already a mess, from a moral standpoint and Edelgard is pretty much the embodiment of that. She's objectively the villain of the story, though the player does have the option of siding with her instead. This does give us some much needed insight into her backstory, which does provide a legitimate reason for her actions. As a child, she and all ten of her siblings were captured by a conspiracy of nobles, including her own uncle, and subjected to a series of horrific experiments in order to implant the Crest of Flames into them with Edelgard being the sole survival and successful test subject. You know, like Nintendo does. Understandably, this leaves her with a deep-seated hatred of the Crests and the Church of Seiros that enables them, and she swears to destroy them by any means necessary. However, unlike with Hilda, Edelgard's ends do not justify the means, since the scope of her crimes is just far too vast. Even as a student in the Officer's Academy, she dons the disguise of the Flame Emperor and allies with the terrorist group known as Those Who Slither in the Dark, and makes several violent attacks on the church. She forces her father to abdicate and assumes the Adrestian throne herself, using her power to declare war on the church and launch a full-scale invasion. She begins her conquest of Fodlan, personally killing Dimitri, or Claude, or both, depending on which route is chosen, and in the Crimson Flower route, where she becomes the lead character, her actions are slightly more tolerable, as she will occasionally act against her ambitions in order to keep innocence out of the conflict. However, as you might imagine, rare acts of mercy in one of four routes? Well, yeah, that's just not enough to save Edelgard from a spot in our evil category. And she only barely misses out on our very bottom spot. But speaking of which, our gold medal of evil goes to the intergalactic invader, Princess Shroob. Technically, this entry encompasses both the younger and elder Shroob sisters, which we've decided to lump together due to them both having the same name and being indistinguishable in terms of morality. They are the leaders of the Shroob race, and they end up invading the Mushroom Kingdom since their home world is withering. They try to capture Princess Peach in order to take over the castle, only for the elder Shroob to get trapped within the Cobalt Star. This doesn't deter the younger Shroob, as she kidnaps Peach, continues her invasion, drains the toads of their life forces to use as fuel, and tricks the Mario Brothers and their younger counterparts into restoring the Cobalt Star in order to free the elder Shroob. Unlike with our previous entries, there are just no redeeming features of the Shroob princesses. They have no regard for others' lives, take everything they can get a hold of, and use any means necessary that they have at their disposal to get what they want. Because of all this, the Shroob princesses easily earn themselves the distinction of being the most evil princesses in all of Nintendo. And with that, it's time for us to move on to our Medals of Evil to see which princesses deserve just a little more attention. We're going to give the Darwin Medal to Corrin. Her naivete just ends up causing a lot more problems than she herself is able to solve. The Lust Medal will be given to Ruto. Her crush on Link is both unwanted and unwarranted, causing quite the consternation. That said, we will also give an honorable mention to any incarnation of Edika who ends up marrying Ephraim, simply because Sweet Home Runes doesn't roll off the tongue nearly as well. The Envy Medal is an easy one. Hilda's desire to claim the Hyrulean Triforce is what sets the entire game's events into motion. Likewise, we'll also be giving her the Greed Medal for pretty much the same reason. 
Another easy one is the Wrath Metal. Edelgard lets her rage over the crest consume her so fully that she sees nothing except for her ambitions of destroying them once and for all. We'll give the Gluttony Metal to the Shroob Princesses. Their consumption of the Vim created from the life force of Toads is just absolutely reprehensible. The Sloth Metal is going to Peach. At this point, her not taking action when Bowser kidnaps her is bordering on willful ignorance. Finally, the Pride Medal will be going to Styla. From an outside perspective, it's not too hard to see her fixation on fashion as vanity, making her a shoe in for this one. But what do you think? Let us know if you agree, and be sure to hit that notification bell and binge our Good to Evil playlist, where we break down the moralities of the characters in your favorite games. But most importantly, stay wicked,